Hello Internet, my name is Quinn and this is Blondie Hacks. I'm back on the Pennsylvania A3 Switcher locomotive build this week. It's time for some more detailed parts. We're going to make all of the handrails and grab irons that go all the way around the body of the tender. We're very close to the end on this tender, so stick with it. I think you'll find these little pieces interesting, so let's go. When last we left our tender, it had this rather sharp set of stairs. But what it's missing is a hand railing that runs alongside those stairs. If we look at the HO model to give you a sense of what we're going to be building first, this is the railing here. It's got some kind of funny looking proportions on it, as you'll see, because the center stanchions are straight, or rather perpendicular to the railing, but the end ones are at angles, so it looks like the spacing is uneven. Here you can see the railing on a prototype example of the A3. It's a little hard to see. It looks like a lot of times crews actually removed this railing or perhaps work around the locomotive removed it for them because they're often missing as in this photo. The design of this railing seems to vary quite a bit as well from A3 to A3. On this example you can see the railing extends further back and it goes all the way down into the curved rear section of the tender. This seems to be less common however. The most common arrangement seems to be as shown on the HO model where the railing stops a couple feet short of the bottom of the tender which makes that first step a bit of a climb for the crew, but that's what I'm going to be building because that's what Kozo's drawings show. First up are the little feet that support the bottom of this railing. I've got some 303 stainless bar stock for this. I'm going to kind of do some mass production here because I actually need six of these little feet. So I'm going to lay them all out on this piece of bar stock, and I'm going to try to come up with an order of operations that will be efficient for making all six of them in one go. I'm going to start by rough cutting out the entire batch of them from one go in this piece of bar stock. Then I'm going to set them up in the mill and I'm going to mill the outer dimensions of this bar stock to the correct width for all six of these pieces. I'm not going to mill it to length however. We're going to be doing them one at a time lengthwise along this bar. I'll clean up one end of this bar and that's going to give me a reference surface from which to start placing holes. The trick is I've got three holes to put in each of these feet, but the holes need to be correctly centered on the pieces after they're cut apart. So I'm going to use that first edge as a reference, and I've centered up on the vice jaws on the y-axis. Now I can center drill and drill the center hole of each foot. This is the hole that the actual railing stanchions go in. And then I can center drill and drill holes down either side, which are the mounting holes for each foot. You can kind of see how I'm making all six at once. The trick to this method is that I've left enough space between these holes for more than one foot because I need room to cut them apart and still have material left to clean up the sides of each piece down to dimension. So that's a bit of a gamble between how good you think you are with a bandsaw and how much material you think you're going to need to clean up. I kept it pretty tight here, but if I was to do this again, I might leave a little more space. I also chamfered the tops of one side of each hole in order to give clearance for silver solder. Now we're ready to start cutting them apart. I go over to the bandsaw and I very carefully cut the first one off the side. I'm trying to split them right down the middle on my scribe lines so that I have room to machine down to proper dimension for both pieces on either side of that cut. Then I take the remaining batch and go back to the mill to create the reference surface for the next one. To figure out how much to remove from that bandsaw cut, I'm using a gauge pin in the hole and measuring with a caliper from that. This is not super accurate, but it's accurate enough for this. If you really needed the holes to be absolutely perfectly centered on each piece, then you'd want to drill the holes after cutting them all to dimension. A method like this is never going to be as accurate as that, but it's a lot less work. With that face machined to dimension, I take it over to the bandsaw again, cut that one off, and do the same for the next one and all the rest of them. Now I have all six pieces with one correctly machined surface and one rough cut bandsaw surface. So then I can set them all up vertically in this arrangement to machine the final face down to correct width. And there's the first piece done. This goes really quickly for the rest of them because this step repeats on Z. So I can just run through each of the pieces placing them on the parallels. I don't have to change the cutter height and I run them all through at the same height and I know they're all going to come out the same width. 
The final operation requires rounding the ends of each of these pieces. So for that, I'm going to add a new pin to my end rounding fixture. I did a video on making this. If you've been following my channel closely, you will have seen me do this. I add a new hole the same diameter as the ones in the plates. Then I go over to the lathe and make a little pin to fit in there. And this will allow me to swing these pieces over on the belt sander and round the ends. Just like this. I have to say I'm really pleased with this fixture. I've made quite a few parts with it now and it's really working well. The dovetail slide gives really nice control and in cases like this I can use a poker or something to keep my hands away from the belt so that I can round corners and ends on very small pieces. It goes very quickly. I can run through both ends of all six pieces extremely quickly and the results look really great. It's not completely repeatable. This is more of an aesthetic corner rounding. If you really need it perfectly accurate, like if these were cam lobes or something like that, then you'd need some sort of a rotary table fixture. But for pieces this small, a fixture like that is a lot of work to set up and really isn't necessary. At this point, I realized I'd forgotten to thin out the stock at the start like I was supposed to. That bar stock I have is twice the thickness of the final plates, so I needed to set them all up one more time with a very careful fixture involving some parallels and some shim stock to get them at just the right height above the vice jaws such that I can mill them in half and not touch the vice jaws. This would have been a whole lot easier if I had remembered to do it the way I had planned in my order of operations at the beginning, but once again this setup does repeat in Z, so it was pretty quick to run through them all. Here are the final feet. I'm very pleased with how those turned out. You'll note there's only five. More on that in a second. For the Americans, the Canadian quarter is very slightly larger and slightly thinner than yours, but otherwise it's the same. For the rest of the world, if you want a scale reference, here's a standard metric duck. Now for the railings themselves. For this, I picked up some 304 stainless wire. It comes in a big bundle from McMaster in 12 inch straight lengths. The length is a little bit shorter than I would have liked, but any longer and you have to buy it in coils. And coils are virtually impossible to ever get truly straight, so starting with these straight pieces is really nice. Now I just need to figure out how to bend them. I have a small tubing bender that I thought might work, and in fact it does. It actually does quite a nice job. The problem is this is the smallest radius I can get, which is a little bit too big for some use cases, and it requires a lot of excess length on either side of the bend. And that will not work for me because I'm limited by these 12 inch lengths. Some of these pieces that I need will just barely fit in 12 inches. My next thought was to use a mandrel in combination with some toolmaker's clamps, so I thought I could hold it with the clamps to keep the sides of the bend straight and then bend it around the mandrel. However, there really isn't room for this with any kind of reasonable radius, so I ended up just freehanding it with the toolmaker's clamps, forgetting the mandrel. And actually, that works quite well. Kozo actually has a tool in the book for this, and the tool essentially boils down to a toolmaker's clamp with a V groove in it. The V groove doesn't seem to be particularly necessary and regular old toolmaker's clamps seem to work just fine. The further apart the clamps are, the larger a radius bend you end up with. In my case, I've got some tricky angles to hit, so I've got my protractor out. If you're wondering what amazing vitamins I've taken that allow me to bend 304 stainless wire by hand, this wire comes in an annealed state. It's actually designed for bending. So again, thanks to McMaster for this perfect product for this application. It looks like I'm in the ballpark on that first bend. So on to the second bend. These first two bends are really critical because they set the length of the railing overall, and I got to get the angles just right to match the tender. Luckily, a little bit of math on the protractor helps make sure that happens. If I did that right, then with the upper stanchion vertical, the lower stanchion should end up in the right place, and the space between the surface of the tender and the rail should be the length of the vertical stanchions. It looks like that will be correct once I trim the far end a little bit. So I just barely got away with that in the 12 inch length, but everything looks correct. So I will rough cut those two center stanchions now from another piece of this stuff. Regular hacksaw seems to cut it just fine. Don't need anything fancy there. Now remember how I was talking about six feet and then suddenly there were five? It's because partway through this process, I realized the sixth foot has to have a 17 degree angle on the stanchion hole because the last foot sits down at an angle on the tender and the stanchion has to come into it at an angle in order to be vertical. So I thinned out an off cut of that 303 stainless bar stock, drilled the two side holes, and then I center drilled the center hole 
and then tilted the piece up to the 17 degree angle that's required in order to get that final stanchion vertical. Then I can take my pointer and line it up on that center mark. That ensures that the hole is in the correct position relative to the side holes and the machined side face. Then I can take an end mill and create a flat spot. I don't have an end mill the same size as this hole. It's a bit of an odd size, but I did have one slightly larger. And then I center drill and drill out the flat spot. That makes sure that the drill doesn't wander off of the 17 degree angle. So it goes straight through the material on that center mark that we made. And now that hole will be at a 17 degree angle relative to the piece. So if I did my job right then, that plate is going to go on there and sit at a 17 degree angle matching the tender when the stanchion is vertical. And that actually looks pretty good. I think that worked. That was a tricky little operation, that one. So I finished that foot just like the others. And now, moment of truth, that looks really good. Both feet are sitting flat on the tender surface at their respective angles, and both stanchions are vertical. So I think we can move on. The stanchions are spaced evenly along the top rail, but because they're sitting at a different angle than the end stanchions, it actually looks like they're unevenly spaced. So there is a weird optical illusion there. I'll just head off your comments there saying they aren't evenly spaced. They are. It's just an optical illusion that exists on the prototype as well. So I've got those marked. Now I need to cross drill some holes through that top rail to pin the stanchions in place. I needed a very special fixture for that, which I happen to have because I made it and I made a video on it too. Go watch that if you want to juice my numbers a little bit. I'll wait. Hey, welcome back. I centered up on Y with the edge finder. And on X, I centered up on the hole in the fixture with the drill. If this hole didn't already exist, I would drill it first through the center of the fixture. I zero the DRO here because now I need to move down to the mark for the other stanchion because I can't see the mark. It's inside the fixture. So instead, I move down the correct spacing on the DRO, then slide the workpiece in the fixture until the other mark lines up with the pointer. Then I can go back to zero on the DRO and I'm going to be back on the center of my fixture, and I know the hole is going to be in the correct place on the workpiece. Then, of course, I'm careful to line it up so that the stanchions are vertical as well. And then away we go. Drill right through into that stainless bar stock. Here's a little trick for extending the life of drill guides like this. Make sure the drill is inside the guide before you start the machine, because then the cutting edge isn't passing down through the top of the hole with the drill running. Because if your alignment isn't perfect, that's when you wear out the drill guide because the cutting edge on the drill chews it up a little bit as it finds its center in the hole. So you start it up in the hole and you don't have that problem. After the first one is drilled, I can now pull it down until the position of the second hole is roughly in the fixture. But again, to get it aligned, I move the other way, offsetting using the DRO, and then pull the material through the stock until it lines up with the drill at the correct spacing on the DRO. It also gives me the correct vertical orientation of the stock. Once it's lined up with that drill, and the drill passes through smoothly, then I know the hole is in the right place, and the stock is oriented correctly, such that when I move back to zero on the DRO, once again, the second hole will be in the correct position. I hope all that made sense. It's a little bit difficult to explain. But after all that, I can now pull apart the fixture, and you'll see that I've got the two cross holes drilled, and they're both vertical, correctly aligned with the other two stanchions and the correct distance apart. That seemed to go very well. Those holes are for pins, so now I need those pins. Again, you could use stainless wire for that. I didn't have any of the correct diameter, but I do have some stainless bar stock of a diameter that will fit in a collet on my lathe, so I'm going to make those pins. These are very, very small diameter, 51 thousandths. And the trick to turning diameters that small on the lathe is to do it all in one cut because on the first cut, you've got the support, the rigidity provided by the full diameter of the stock you're cutting. So you can get away with it if you do one cut. If you try to do it in two or three or four or more passes, subsequent passes, there's no rigidity left in that stock and you can't make successful cuts. There's a minimum amount of rigidity required to cut any material. And 51 thousandths is probably below that limit, at least on 304 stainless. But if you nail it in one, then that's a perfect pin. I'm not going to bother trying to part that off. I'm just going to use the fret saw. I'm not certain, but I think these pins might be the smallest pieces in the entire locomotive. I'm not sure. They're certainly the smallest ones I've made so far. Now it gets tricky, however. I need to drill matching holes in the ends of these stanchions. And these stanchions are 100 thou diameter. That's a strange dimension for which I do not have a collet. 
So instead, I'm going to make a fixture that will allow me to hold that wire in a collet that I have. I found a piece of scrap that happened to fit this particular collet. The outer diameter of this fixture doesn't matter. This is just what happened to fit what I already had. So I face the end of that to get it square. Then I center drill and drill a hole through this piece, the same diameter as the piece I'm trying to hold, that 100 thou wire. Because I did this in the collet chuck, that drill diameter and the outer diameter will be very, very concentric with each other. Then I can take that out, take it over to the bandsaw, and cut a slit most of the way down the middle of that. That's going to create sort of an adapter collet, if you will. It's going to allow me to hold on to this piece with a larger collet. So I insert that in the larger collet. It's a good idea to align the slits on those collets to make sure that the inner collet gets compressed. I didn't quite do that here, but it's close enough. Now when I clamp down on that, the outer collet is going to squeeze the inner collet and provide a nice concentric grip on that piece. This will allow me to face the end of this stock and then center drill and drill the tiny hole down the end of it that I need. And that little emergency collet or temporary collet, if you will, is just aluminum. You don't have to get fancy with the materials on something like this. If you're only going to use it a handful of times, aluminum works just fine. That is a perfect 52 thou hole centered on a 100 thou rod, and my 51 thou pin slides right in there perfectly. That is going to be beautiful. And I'll hang on to that little aluminum subcollet. Once again, it can be used quite a few times before the aluminum gives out on it. Now you might be wondering why did we bother making that a separate pin instead of turning it as a smaller diameter on the end of the stanchion? Well, you're about to find out. This is sort of Kozo next level kind of thing. I might have just turned those pins and silver soldered it together and called it a day, but no, no. Kozo has you go one step further. The reason those are separate pieces is so that you can fish mouth the ends of those stanchions for a really perfect fit. That little fish mouth is so small that trying to set up any kind of machine tool to do it is probably a waste of time. So I did it by hand with a round needle file. This level of detail is kind of hard to see on camera, but in person you can see the difference between the square pieces of round bar butting up against each other versus the fish mouth fit that really gets them tightly fitted together. So you can see there's a little bit of a fish mouth facing the camera on the end of that part. Now if I slide that on to the pin, and then after it's on there I'll rotate it 90 degrees so you can see the difference. And there it is. See how nicely that fits together? It's like a little tiny roll cage on a little tiny race car. It's a little thing, but it does make a difference and it will make the silver solder joint a lot better. Was that worth all of that extra effort? Mm, hard to say. You probably could have got away with just filling that whole joint with solder and filing it. I'm not going to say otherwise, but I followed the book on this one. Time for some assembly now. I've decanted some of my pickling acid out of my big bin into a little container because these parts are all stainless. And you don't want to put ferrous parts in your pickling acid because it contaminates it and it will ruin it for other metals. This locomotive has a lot of small stainless parts like this that will need soldering, so I'll keep this little container to the side just for ferrous stuff and I'll keep my big bin of acid for the other brass and copper stuff. Everything gets pickled, all the little pins and everything, and everything gets fitted together, being careful to align the little fish mouths in the right way around, and away we go for soldering. Now these pieces are so tiny that I vastly overestimated how much heat they were going to need. Again, I'm used to doing boiler work and other much bigger pieces, so I way overheated these joints. I fried that flux. I barbecued it. I cooked it out of there. You can see the steel getting red hot, which is way too hot for the flux. That means the solder didn't flow very well. That's what the flux is doing, is making sure the solder flows in everywhere. But we'll see. I'm going to file down the excess and see if it's a strong joint. If it isn't, I'll redo it. But it looks like actually I got away with that. After I filed away the excess, the solder did bond to all the pieces and the joints filled in, so it was okay. But yeah, pro tip, don't use that much heat for pieces this small. That actually looks pretty good though. A little more filing to clean up some of the excess solder right in the corners, but I'm happy with that. It's certainly strong. On to the little feet now. Remember they have a chamfer on the underside, which gives the silver solder somewhere to kind of fill in and make a stronger joint. So these pieces go on there, like so, and making sure to orient them correctly, of course. And everything's been pickled once again, and I'll get some flux in there. In order to align the feet 90 degrees, I'm using the edge of the vice jaw, since that's clamping the railing. If I get the foot square to the jaw, then it should be square to the railing. Verify the height of the foot is correct, and then I'll get a little tiny piece of solder sitting right on there. 
This is good insurance against overheating the joint like I just did on the previous one, because as soon as the correct temperature is reached, the solder will flow. The way I did the previous one was by heating up the joint and then touching the solder, but this way you're not going to overheat the joint because as soon as it's hot enough, the solder is going to flow when it's ready and you know you're done. And that worked much better. A little bit of filing for excess solder once again on the bottom, and that looks like a really nice joint. Very pleased with that. So I'm getting better at doing this really small stuff. A smaller torch would help too. This is the smallest torch I have, but it's still quite a bit overkill. And the thing stands up on its own, so I must have done something, right? However, I also did something wrong, and I'm not really sure what. When it came time to mock everything up with the stairs to figure out where to drill and tap all the mounting holes, something was a little fishy. The top and bottom are supposed to line up, and my stairs are about half a stair too long if I put everything exactly where the drawing says it's supposed to be. I couldn't quite figure out what was going on. I measured and remeasured and remeasured everything I could find, and I could not find anything that was the wrong dimension here. You know, more than by a few thousands here and there. And yet I'd ended up with this cumulative error of half a stair tread. I studied this and studied this and really couldn't figure out what the problem was. I think it's some kind of subtle difference in the angle of my tender and the riser height of my stairs, something like that. At this point, I know all the armchair experts are going to tell me what I did wrong, but trust me, I measured everything that had a number on that drawing and I could not find an error. So I don't know where this cumulative half stair length problem came from. But what I found is if I moved the stairs forward about a quarter of a tread, then that actually lined up the bottom by a full tread. So if I just move the stairs forward a little bit and then cut off a full stair tread at the bottom, then everything lines up. And I double checked and there are definitely supposed to be seven treads. But if I remove one full tread, everything lines up beautifully. So I've always said I'm not a rivet counter and well, Apparently I'm not even a stair counter, so uh, yeah, sorry about this uh, purists, but I don't know what went wrong and I'm not going to start remaking all of these parts. It's probably something fundamental about the size and shape of the tender. Now again, the overall length of the tender is correct, the frame it sits on is correct, everything I can think of to measure is correct, but there's some subtle difference probably in the angle of the back of the tender or the exact location where the tender bends downwards at the top, like that distance between the coal bunker and the edge of the first bend, something in there is not quite the same as it's supposed to be. So anyway, cutting off a stair tread fixes it, so that's what I'm doing. This was a little painful and I had to do some soul searching before I did this, but I decided after lots of thinking and consulting with my patrons that this was the right move. We may never have an answer to the great stair mystery of OT23, but as you can see, removing one stair makes everything line up perfectly top and bottom, and everything's in the right position top to bottom, and Oh, uh, well, I don't know. It looks great to my eye, so I don't know. Sorry, stair counters. I mean rivet counters. You're just going to have to live with it. Now, however, I finally had enough information to permanently mount everything. So the stairs got laid out a few bolt holes at a time to make sure everything stayed tight and aligned. Everything was drilled and tapped on the mill. This was pretty easy to do because I could do it all from one setup for the most part. Other than the top two holes, all the mounting holes are in the same plane. So one slightly weird angled setup on the mill, and I could do all of these mounting holes. The drawing actually called for mounting holes in every second stair, but I put them in all the stairs because it really made them sit nice and tight down against the tender and made the whole structure feel more sturdy. So it was a bunch of extra work, but I felt like that was worth doing. That is very sturdy indeed now. To mark the mounting holes for the railing, I didn't have a transfer punch the exact right size, so I used the clearance drill for the feet in a pin vise. Just a couple of twists on that, and that will mark the hole sufficient for then punching and center drilling and drilling. And that is looking pretty good. I'm getting very good at tapping tiny holes, let me tell ya. One really pleasant surprise here was how sturdy the final result is. Like once you got all those little bolts and stuff in there, I mean you can pick up the whole tender by this railing and it doesn't flex or bend at all. It's kind of amazing how these parts are all so delicate in isolation, but you put them all together and the final result is really very strong. Like I really don't have to worry about babying that railing. For the side railings, I need a bunch more of those little feet of a slightly different style. However, I came up with what I think is going to be a better order of operations. I had to go into my stockpile and find a different piece of 303 stainless. This is a bar stock chunk that I found and I've got a slitting saw. I'm going to double check the thickness of this because what I'm going to do is I'm going to make these pieces in a vertical stack on this bar stock 
and then slice them off of there like a stack of vertical bread, if you will. Now this is not my idea. This is an order of operations for small parts that I've seen somewhere else. Apologies if it was you. I don't remember where I saw this, but this is my first time trying it. So I've got the profile roughed out on the bandsaw sticking up vertically. Then I side milled this area to the final outer dimensions of one piece. Remember, this is a vertical stack of these final pieces. And this is a really nice method because you get better dimensions on all the pieces and the final holes are going to be better centered on the pieces because they're being done after the outer dimensions of the parts are. So then I drill all the holes in the pieces all the way down through the entire stack. And now I can just slice them right off of there. I was a little hesitant to try this because slitting saw setups are terrifying at the best of times and a slitting saw in stainless is 10 times as terrifying. However, because these parts are so small, I was willing to give it a shot. And also this is 303 stainless, which is the easiest of the stainlesses to machine. If this was something really gnarly like 431 surgical stainless, then you wouldn't be seeing this video because as of this recording, I'd still be lying dead in my shop with a shard of slitting saw in my pancreas. This did work very well, however, and I strongly recommend it over the previous method that I showed for making pieces this small. This really was quicker and the resulting pieces look nicer. Got better finishes on all the sides, the dimensions are better, the holes are more accurately centered, just better all around. Here's a standard click spring scriber for scale. These little feet are even smaller than the previous ones, but they came out great. Next up are some low and wide grab irons that go at the front and back of the locomotive. I'm making two of these, one for the tender and one will be put in storage for the locomotive someday. The main trick here is to get the length exactly right because they have to line up well with some drilled holes that are already in the frame. Luckily that wasn't too difficult because honestly I'm getting quite good at this metal bending business. First try I made two pieces the perfect length and identical to each other. Really, that could not have... Uh, oh, Editor Quinn, I told you to cut this piece out. No, I'm trying to look awesome here. You show all the scraps, now I look like an idiot. Anyway, this is a technique you've seen before if you've been watching this series. This is a couple of little L brackets, and I machined them out of a single block in a single setup, what I call the CNC method of cutting out pieces, because this is how a CNC machine would do it. This also works really well for small pieces. In stainless, not quite as well as brass, because you have to take a lot of light cuts, but it's a lot quicker and easier than doing a million tiny setups for an L-shaped bracket like that. These side rails attach between the tender tank and the frame of the tender, which means I had to fully assemble the entire tender to get these dimensions right and to get the mounting holes in the right spots. These were pretty tricky. Once again, I marked the holes with the clearance hole in the pin vise trick. However, I also drilled the holes with a tapping drill in the pin vise. On the ends of the tender like this, there's really no way to set it up in the mill. And I know people are going to say you should use a power drill or a Dremel or something for this. Hand power drills don't run fast enough for drills this small. You're going to break the bits doing that. And Dremels are too difficult to control in a situation like that. The drill is going to skate all over and ruin the whole front of your piece. So honestly, in a situation like this, doing it by hand is the best way, I think. It's not a lot of fun and it takes a while, but it works. It's also the safest option for the work because you're guaranteed to get the hole in the right place. You're not going to break the drill and you're not going to risk messing up the whole front of your workpiece. However, to tap that hole, I don't want to do it freehand. So instead, I've got a tapping block. This is just a block of steel I keep around and I drill new clearance holes in it whenever I need a new tap size. What a tapping block or tap guide does is it keeps the tap square to the surface. Now, sometimes that's nice to make sure your threaded holes end up straight. But in this case, what's, what it's doing is keeping me from breaking the tap. In my little modeling career here, I've drilled and tapped probably around a thousand holes that are below number three in size, like number zero, one, or two. And in that time, I've only ever broken two taps. And both times, it was trying to freehand tap. Freehand tapping is just a very dangerous game with taps this small. What breaks taps is either bottoming them out in a blind hole, which is not an issue here, or applying too much lateral force to them while you're tapping. And the tapping block prevents that. I will never attempt to freehand tap with a tap smaller than about number five. It's just too dangerous. Breaking off a tap in a situation like this, so close to the very end of the tender, that would be a very, very bad situation. Luckily for the corresponding mounting holes in the frame, I was able to fit it in the mill. Doing it in the mill is always the best option if you can. 
The mill is going to hold everything straight. It's going to keep your drills from snapping. It's going to keep your taps from breaking. I really like these front rails. They're a cool shape and they look really nice on there. They really tie everything together. And again, surprisingly strong. On the front and back of the final locomotive, just on the back of the tender and the front of the locomotive someday, are these long flat grab irons. These would be for the crew to get up from the footboard and onto the stairs, I suppose. Those came out great as well. Well, there you have it, what I think is a nice collection of handrails. I learned a lot about working with stainless wire and silver soldering small parts and making very small stainless parts. All of this stuff is stainless because none of this stuff is going to be painted. I think it's going to look really nice against the black powder coat that this tender will someday have. We've got a few more detail parts to make, but this tender is very, very close to being finished. I hope you're as excited as I am. I hope you've enjoyed this video and all the rest of them in this series. Thanks so much to my patrons for making all of this content possible, especially this A3 project. Without my patrons, I never would have started something this ambitious. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.